Good morning, everyone. Up until just a second ago. <laughs> now that everybody's ears are open, everybody's awake. Just kidding. Everybody was awake. Now it's time to go to sleep. Uh, good to see everybody here this morning. Looks like we got some folks online. Good morning, everybody. I know everybody's really excited. Exciting time of the year. Not because the leaves are changing color and falling, but because, yay, the elections are coming and the debates have started, right? Yeah, it's such a high spot in our nation's history. <laughs> Did anybody bother with the debates? The whole thing? I don't know how anybody lasted past the first few minutes. I mean, they, I mean, it's almost embarrassing. Yeah, I mean, it was like a, um, some, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know, middle school name calling going on there, you know? Like, well, you have funny hair. Well, you sniff hair. Well, I mean, just, it was pretty, pretty ridiculous. And I, I'm really disappointed that that's, that's where our political system, what, what it has degraded to. Is that something that's supposed to be a debate on issues, real issues affecting our nation, just degrades into finger pointing and, and name calling. There shouldn't be any of that. There should be absolutely no allowance for that in there. But that's what it's all about, even on our local levels. Uh, in, here in the state, have you noticed the ads on the radio and whatnot? Does anyone know where anyone stands actually from that candidate? Or have you heard everything about that candidate from their opponents? Yeah, just a bunch of finger pointing, name calling, trying to trap people in their words, trying to, trying to uh, make accusations that they can't defend. I mean, it's gotten ridiculous and, and, uh, and, and quite embarrassing, really. All the finger pointing, name calling, twisting of words, um, and just ridiculous. And I, I can't help but think uh, about uh, the time of Jesus in the New Testament. And how the Pharisees and Sadducees and, and scribes and Herodians and, and all these other different groups who are all these, these we think of them as religious groups, or really they were political groups more than anything else. And, and how they really like pointing the finger at Jesus and doing the exact same thing that we see today. It's like all our politicians have, have taken their campaign advice from the Pharisees and Sadducees. And just learn how to point fingers, twist words, call names. This is the, the stuff that the Pharisees did. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 22, verse uh, 15 and following, we, we see how, how the Pharisees were really working hard to trap Jesus with his words. It even says that. It even says, then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, another group of, uh, it was a political group, really, that supported Herod, uh, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Let's butter him up a little bit. You know, say some good things about it, right? Kind of, kind of loosen him up a little. Maybe there's some guy like, you know, massaging his shoulders a little bit. Relax a little bit. We, we want to hear the truth from you. And then they throw this out there. They throw this question out there. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Bam! There it is. There's a big trap. And this was like scandalous type stuff back then. You know, th this was one of those questions that, that should have trapped somebody and, and been their, their end, their doom. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? I love it. I mean, he just, just shuts them down. Immediately, because he knows this is not an honest question. This was simply a trap. The Sadducees were doing this too. They were trying to trap Jesus too. And uh, later on in, in verse 23 and following, it says the same day Sadducees came to it. It must have been like election season or something. Because the very same day, here comes another group trying to trap him. <laughs> And they say, uh, that, uh, says that the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses said, oh, we're, we're going we're to throw Moses into this one. There's some authority behind that, right? Because Jesus was a Jew. And so if they say, well, Moses said this, then they're going to trap him because if he says anything against Moses, oh, bad, bad deal, right? That's the end of it. So Moses said, if a man dies having no children... His brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. It's called the law of leveret marriage. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died and having no offspring left his wife to his brother. 
So too, the second and third, down to the seventh. They come up with this like extreme example, you know, kind of, kind of a ridiculous example, really, to trap him. So too, the second and the third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. What's funny about this is the Sadducees don't even believe in the resurrection. And that's right where Jesus goes. He says, you know, you don't know the word of God, nor do you know the power of God. He says, in the resurrection that you don't even believe in, there is no married nor given in marriage. So he shuts them down again. I just love it. Just, just you know, close the book on them. They're done. But then there's more. In verse 34 through 36, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, oh, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Not honest questions. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? That nah, Jesus shuts him down too. Matthew chapter 9, 32 through 34. As they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. Man, that's awesome. The people are going, Wow, this is incredible. This, this guy's got power over demons, evil spirits. And he just, just healed this guy. He just cast it out, made the guy normal. But the Pharisees said, Oh, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. Right? So now we've degraded. We're not even trying to trap him in his words anymore. We're just going to name call and point fingers. Matthew 12, verse 22 through 24 says, Then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him. And he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? They're like, oh, remember this guy who was promised in the scriptures? Maybe this is him. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. In Matthew 12, verse 10, it says, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on a Sabbath? <laughs> so that they might accuse him. I mean, over and over and over. In verse 14, it says, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Just name calling, finger pointing, trying to trap him in his words over and over and over. And it wasn't just Jesus either. I mean, they acted pretty ill towards other people as well. They were really down on Jesus, but they would get down on other people too. If like, for example, Matthew 9, verse 10 and 11, it says, And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Horrible. These horrible dregs of society that Jesus is associating with. Tax collectors and sinners. What kind of people were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes who did this? Uh, what kind of folks were they who were trying to trap Jesus in their words, who were pointing the finger, who were name calling, who were pointing out everybody else's wrongdoings? looking down upon them. What did the other people in the world think of Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes? How did they view them? What was their role in society, so to speak? Oddly enough, we may not think this, but these were like the religious elite. I mean, these were the folks who knew God's word. And they were the ones who could go out and teach others how to live life according to God's word. And these were church going folks. I don't like that. I don't like that one bit. <laughs> that hits me too close to home. But these were church going folks. You know, these were the folks who came in dressed nicely, appropriately for church, right? Shirts and tights, buttons on their shirts, nice clothing, not what they worked in all week. And the, the Pharisees and the Sadduceans, you know, they, they got dolled up 
that morning to, to, to go to church, so to speak. You know, they, they wore their Sunday's best and, and combed their hair and, and trimmed their nails and, and, you know, maybe even had um, a fresh pedicure, you know. These, these were sharp-looking folks. I, I wonder how they treated others who maybe came in and weren't dressed as well. Didn't know God's word as well. Maybe had some sin in their life. Maybe they were a tax collector <laughs> or a tax collector's son or daughter. Folks who didn't dress or live according to their standards. I wonder if they would go out of their way to make them feel at home. If they were of a different social class or different nationality, or if they lived in a van down by the river instead of in a nice house. And I wonder about how they were out and about in town. You know, I see, the, see them strutting around on some pretty nice camels with all the options. Power windows, power steering, power door locks, air conditioning, remote start, you know, 100,000 mile warranty, probably one horsepower. That's pretty impressive for a camel. You know, they, they were the folks, they, they could park that camel at Walmart right where everyone could see it, you know. And these were squared away folks. They'd leave their nice houses, go to work and school and the pool and the grocery store and the bank and their nice cars wearing their nice clothes. And they could look at all the other people around them who didn't live like them, who didn't know God's word like them, who didn't worship like them, who didn't have jobs like them. And they could say, these people are sick, a bunch of sinners. And I know that's how they acted because Jesus says so. In Luke 18, verse 10 and 12, he says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Oh, those nasty tax collectors that the Pharisees couldn't stand, right? The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. What would be the equivalent today of that? <laughs> Thank you that I'm not a sinner, Lord. I go to church every Sunday. I put money in the collection plate. It hits me too close to home. I wonder if they knew that they were like that. Or I wonder if they thought, just like I think, well, I'm okay. Because I do what God says in his word. I know God's word and I go to church. So I'm okay. Sometimes I think we, it's just so easy to get so busy living my good life. And I don't stop and realize that those sick people, those tax collectors, those sinners... We're the ones who are supposed to be learning about the great physician from me. You know, it's so easy to get so wrapped up in living my good life <laughs> that I forget that I'm supposed to be living my life for God. And being an example and being a light and going out and showing them how to do the same thing. It's so easy for me to get so wrapped into, into doing what I want to do and I feel like my job as a Christian is to show up to church every Sunday. And that's good enough. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, Herodians, I mean, these folks were so busy basking in their own righteousness and, and knowing that they were right about everything. They had God's word figured out. And, and they went and they worshipped each week. And they didn't even realize that they, they had become just as sick as those people they were looking down upon. As the people who they were pointing a finger at Jesus saying, why are you associating with these, these sick people? And that just hits me too close to home. I read this and I think, man, this is such a great lesson for those Pharisees and Sadducees. I hope those scribes, I hope those Herodians, I hope all those folks who did that stuff learned their lesson. And I stopped to think, maybe they thought just like I do. Maybe they were just thinking that just because I go to church and I know God's word and I've got it all figured out, that I'm all right. Am I doing the same thing? 
What was God's response when this is where his people got to? When, when the people who were supposed to be the light and supposed to be teaching people about God and how to live life according to him, when they got to this point where instead they were just basking in their own rightness and pointing the finger at everybody else who was doing things differently or even wrong and name calling, what was God's response? What did he do when the people who were supposed to be pointing the way to him were too wrapped up in other things? We actually, he came to earth to do the job himself. That's, that's really what he did. <laughs> because what he has to offer is so valuable that he, he couldn't just stand by and watch his people fail to do their jobs. In fact, Jesus says to them on one occasion in Matthew 8, verse 11 and 12, he said, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow, what a surprise that's going to be for the sons of the kingdom. Anybody here consider themselves part of God's kingdom? Son or daughter of that kingdom? I do. I consider myself one of the sons of the kingdom. So I don't think this was a warning just for Pharisees and Sadducees. It's just as much a warning for me. Would I be surprised if I got thrown into the outer darkness? And so they see Jesus eating with some folks who didn't live up to their standards and they question him. Saying, why, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why did he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Well, why did he take the time to try to get to know these folks? Well, what was he doing that for when there were so many other things he could have been doing? I mean, he could have been building himself a pretty nice house. He was a carpenter, you know. He could have revolutionized footwear and become super famous. Air Jordans, can you imagine Air Jesus? Nobody's got air like Jesus. Could have invented Apple computers, become a billionaire. You'd never lose any files because Jesus saves. There are so many different things he could have done. Can you imagine if Jesus got into like barefoot skiing? That would be incredible. Or skydiving. He wouldn't even need a plane to get up there to jump out and come down. Wouldn't need one of those squirrel suit thingies. Would have been incredible. He could have done anything that he wanted to do. But instead, he was focused first on things that are important. To God. And so he says to the Pharisees in Matthew 9, 12 and 13, in response to this question that's up here. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. But he's not here anymore. He left the earth. He went home to heaven. So who's going to call the right, the sinners? He also gave them this quote from the Old Testament concerning their rightness and how they had God's word all figured out. And how they knew exactly what needed to be done in what way and when and where and how. He said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Oh, but they were so good at those sacrifices. They had it all figured out. They had it down to a science. That's fine and dandy. But God's looking for his people to be merciful to others. To go out to the sick. To help us. What do you think they would have done differently? What do you think the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, all these different groups would have done differently if they had understood what Jesus meant? Or if they would have understood and accepted what Jesus meant? I mean, I, I wonder how, how would they have changed their lives if they knew and, and, and were determined to, to follow that out? That, uh, that God desires mercy and not sacrifice. And that it's, it's more than, than just being right. 
How would they have viewed other people who were different from them? Who didn't maybe know as much as them? Maybe didn't have it all right yet? I wonder what they would have spent their time on. I, I wonder how the scripture could be different. Written differently about the Pharisees and Sadducees. And what it would have to say if they would have understood that. And taken some action on that. You know, what, what kind of things would, would have been their, their priorities in their lives? What things would we read about them? What excuses would they have quit making? What things would have been more important to them? How different would their lives have been? And, and, and maybe how many, how many lives would be different uh, from the people around them who they infected? You know, how many people would have had better lives? Maybe even eternal lives. If scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians were really living for God. Well, it's too late for them now. We're not going to change these scriptures, right? <laughs> That's not going to happen. This is history. We can't change that. But it's not too late for us. Sometimes reading about folks like that in the scriptures gets me a bit uncomfortable because I see too many similarities between myself and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these folks who are claiming to be God's people but weren't really living it. We're missing the point, putting other things in place of doing God's will. And so when I get in that uncomfortable place, I've got to look at what changes I've got to make. Because God has called his people to make a difference in the lives around them. He didn't call Sai to be a professional worshiper. Our worship assemblies are incredibly important. But God didn't call us to be professional Sunday morning worshipers. It's not what being a Christian is all about. He didn't, didn't call us to be experts in the law. And it's incredibly important to study God's word so we can know his will. But we've got to do it. Or it's of no use at all. He didn't call us to be religious critics of those who do things differently. Or even those who are doing things wrong. Even though it's important for us to learn what is right. And do that. He did call us to be his body. And to do as he did. To make a difference to those around us. The sick people. The tax collectors. And the sinners. To show them God's love. And to give them the good news. If there's something that we can do to help you. On that path. Sometimes we've got to step back and face up to those similarities that we see in the wrong people. Sometimes we've got to step back and go, I've got changes I've got to make. And this is uncomfortable because I think Jesus would maybe call me a Sadducee. I think he would maybe say, you know, you're living a little too much like those Herodians. Or you know, you're, you're really acting like a scribe. Now, if that's the case, or if there's some other need that you have, something that we can do to help you be closer to God, to live his will in a greater sense, and to be more infectious in a positive manner to those around you, please, please come up and let me know how we can help you do that as we stand together and sing the song.